So first, I just want a show of hands of who's tried speech therapy in the room. Okay, so a bunch of people. I, um, I think that uh, what Joanna made reference to, so we, I, I work at UCSF, so I work at a big referral center. And so sometimes we see patients that, we see people that have spasmodic dysphonia or tremor or and tremor and have seen a speech therapist and quote unquote failed therapy. And I think um, one of the things we have to keep in mind is what the definition of failed therapy is, right? And what therapy can provide and create um, expectations of what we can change behaviorally and what is that signal from the brain coming to the larynx and, and making it spasm. So, so um, the other aspect which Joanna alluded to is not all uh, SLPs or speech pathologists are trained in voice. And we get, we get a little voice geeky and we get really excited to kind of work on these little nuances that we, like Joanna was alluding to with articulation. We get excited about trying to figure out what's gonna work for each person. Because while there are, um, where there's a physiologic way and an, an anatomical way, everything is set up to work. We have to figure out what each person connects with and how this um, disorder is manifesting in that person. So there is not one quick answer to any of these things. Sometimes it's experimenting with different things to see what works for you. And somebody that's inexperienced with voice is not gonna have a large repertoire probably to pull from. Okay, so with that, now that I get off my soapbox. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let me find the arrows here. So what is voice therapy? It's one of the um, treatment, the management options for those with spasmodic dysphonia and tremor. And I'm including tremor in this because because about a third of people with SD have tremor. Some people have tremor alone, so we're just gonna sort of um, include it in there and we'll talk about some troubleshooting and why we choose certain things for certain um, uh, voice characteristics. So we often use voice therapy, it can be used alone. Most commonly, I would say, as you could see from the panels earlier, probably maybe it's used in conjunction with Botox treatment or as a pre and post surgical intervention. Um, uh, Murray and Woodson in 95 published a study that, was, that basically supported the use of voice therapy with the treatment of Botox because it can lengthen the time in between injections. And actually, and some of them it lengthened the time in between, while that wasn't st statistically significant, um, they did find that the actual good quality in that length and time was better. So even if it, there's not more time in between the injection, there was more periods of better voice during the, the injection. So that's um, helpful. So I like this definition. It doesn't talk about mind and body, which I sort of add in, but voice therapy is an approach to treating voice disorders that involves vocal and physical exercises coupled with behavioral change. And I think when we, this is sort of a, it all encompassing, hopefully, as we're sort of approaching voice therapy. We can give indirect suggestions on or indirect voice therapy, and we can give direct voice therapy. Indirect is more of the vocal hygiene, hydration, strategies, word choice, those sorts of things. And then we can give direct voice therapy, which is really that the working to maximize the anatomy, physiology of, of how we're making our voice. And voice therapy, as we heard earlier today, can help with differential diagnosis. So sometimes if we're unsure of what we're hearing, uh, then we'll do a few sessions of voice therapy to see if we can tease out what is, is, is going on. All right, so I'm gonna skip the definitions because I think we've done that, unless anybody objects to that. All right, so. When a patient comes in to me and, and to our clinic, generally we always see new patients on interdisciplinary clinic with one of our laryngologists and our speech pathologist. So we're listening from the medical side and we're listening from the behavioral side. Uh, and I have these evaluation tasks because we, we have people read, we have people sustain vowels. So we're trying to figure out in our, as we're listening and having um, people read certain tasks, what vocal characteristics they're demonstrating. And as I'm listening to this, I'm, I'm differentiating between maybe adductor and abductor SD, 
but I'm also listening to how is the patient, how is the person managing the, the, those breaks, right? Is there, are there extra, is there extra tightening? Is somebody sort of talking like this all the time in an effort to control the spasms? So I'm listening sort of um, what I hear, and then I'm, I'm sort of giving this assessment. Is it, is it AD, is it, is it AB, is there tremor? And is there anything that I can offer to this person that can help make it easier, right? Because we know in behavioral intervention, we're not gonna make the spasms go away, but we want to manage it more effectively. So, so you can see, as you can see, certain things are gonna be easier for um, AB ductor SD, and certain things are gonna be easier for AD ductor, or for, or more difficult, I'm sorry, for AB versus AD. And then in tremor, we typically hear tremor throughout all tasks, but depending on what muscles the tremor involves, we may hear it more, more definitively at high pitch or at low pitch. Um, so it all gives us information so that we can make an individualized plan for each person based on wh what they're coming into us with. So I alluded to the, indir or I talked about indirect therapy earlier versus direct therapy. So let's just spend a little time briefly on the education and counseling fa factor. I think first and foremost, information is, it can be empowering. So really trying to have an understanding, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir here because you're all here. Um, the more you know and understand what's happening, the easy, easier, the more effectively we can deal with things. So if we understand that, our vo that your voice might break on a certain sound, then we can figure out specific management strategies for those sounds or in certain situations. Um, we had a patient with abductor uh, SD that worked at the Hyatt, and her name started with an H. And it was really hard for her. And so we had to figure out, how can we make this easier, right? So coming up with those specific strategies, um, choosing, whether it's choosing different words, you can't choose a different name. <laughs> but you can figure out how to make it easier to get started, potentially. Or just know that the, your voice is going to break on this sound, and you try not to compensate by pushing harder, OK? Uh, there are situational variations, which we've talked about. Um, and then Joanna mentioned earlier, for all who were in the room, about hydration versus humidity. So I won't go into that. Um, then we have direct voice therapy, which is really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of how one may be making their voice. So in direct therapy, we're working to decrease inefficient muscular compensation, right? So if something, if we're kind of trying hard not to try hard, okay? Um, we may do tongue stretches, jaw stretches, breathing exercises, laryngeal massage, other manual techniques to try to reduce tension. But we also then work on coordinating the breath that Joanna set up really nicely for us coordinating that with the onset of voicing. Because here's where the breakdown occurs, right? If you're whispering, it's easier. If you, as soon as the voice turns on, that's when the difficulty comes in. So we have to figure out how can we figure out a balance between airflow and resonance and maximize that. So I mentioned this before, we're, what we're trying to do is not eliminate the spasms, but manage them more effectively. Sometimes when we improve airflow, you may feel the spasm, but it may be perceived less it's by the listener. So that's, that it can be progress. It depends on what bothers you the most about your voice, and that's something I think that as we're doing this individual history taking, we figure out, we p try to pinpoint the biggest complaint and then see if we can address it. So we're trying to make it easier, improve the quality, increase awareness, and your ability to manage vocal variations. Part of this process is building awareness in the body so that you can, rather than feeling like everything is out of your control, you feel like you can anticipate what's going to happen so you can manage it. OK? All right, so there are a multitude of therapy techniques that are physiologically based targeting airflow, the exhalation of air through the vocal folds, um, and targeting breathing and targeting resonance, okay? Um, 
Now these exercises, you, if you look them up, you can see them used for multiple diagnoses. The thing that we're, what helps us choose an exercise is, is part, is one factor is the diagnoses, but this other factor is how the patient is managing that diagnosis, how they're responding to it. So some people may respond, like I demonstrated, with just being tight all the time to avoid their voice breaking. Other people may compensate by being breathy all the time or by sort of moving everything into the back of their throat. Now, I'm going to demonstrate some voices only for the point of, of learning, not to just so that you can hear. So some people may pull, pull way back, right? Other people might just stay tight all the time, and then other people may do that sort of breathy voice. We've heard variations of all of these, but this is where trying some of these exercises can help you sort of rebalance your voice. So, for the next few minutes, I would like to, we can, we can do it a couple of ways. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if anybody is burning desire to come up and join me on stage, we can try a few exercises together. Otherwise, I will sort of take the lead and um, get everybody involved in vocalizing. Want to come up? Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm Sarah. <laughs> Sheila. Yes. Okay, nice to meet you. You live nice in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, my hands are cold. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear <laughs> Sheila's voice right now? I'm going to put the microphone on you. Is that okay? Okay. There we go. Okay, so Sheila, tell me about tell me um, what your diagnosis is. So, I've got mixed A, B, and A, D. Okay. And when was the when did your symptoms start? Uh, Thirty years ago. Have you have you um, sought out treatment? Yes. Okay. And what have you done? Botox from many of the best. Okay. And does it help you? No, it okay. has not. Can you explain to me what your have you had it for in your vocal fold muscle or in the PCA TA or PCA? Do you know? Uh, the vocal fold. Okay. And what is your response to Botox? So all these things are giving me information. The, 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 the onset, how long you've been working with these symptoms, mm -hmm. the response to Botox I think is important to me. I want to know how she's responded to it. So I'm sorry, I'm narrating. Here we go. Okay. So what was your response when you had Botox? Let's see. The first person that I saw was simply interested in giving me Botox as a to discussing these things, okay. the symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, the second person uh, explained everything, but the injection didn't work. Okay. Then I went a second time, uh -huh. um, and years ago, um, then I went to a third person mm -hmm. years later, and he was candid. He said, I think that I might have just missed you know, the correct okay. spot or whatever. Right. Okay. And then I Did moved, you try again? Then I moved out here yes. okay. and I saw a person, but I think I didn't go, on, and I've seen another person since, but I have not gone so regularly, one person regularly so that they could adjust okay. or do six pain. Did you ever get weak and breathy after an injection? Yes. You did? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then did you have any period of relief in, the, in your symptoms? At a point, yes, okay. I did. What is your primary complaint about your voice? The way it sounds. Okay, <laughs> so, it's the, so this is important. Is it the sound, is it the feel, or is it both? And so I don't want to lead her down a path. I want her to tell me what bothers her, and then I might probe a little more. Yeah, you can okay. probe. Hi. <laughs> Do you feel effort to make your voice? Well, I have gone from being an educational consultant to now a business of my own, to now in New York, to now working as a secretary in a school. So I'm terrified every day okay. because the phone rings. Okay. And can you, the, do you feel um, like you have to push to get your voice out? Do you feel... Um, anywhere where it kind of cuts off? Um, it's choppy. Choppy, okay. Um, it can, it, it depends. Like right now I've got a cold, okay. so that adds to it, it a little it. bit too. Okay. 
but um, I, I had to go from Sheila Harris mm -hmm. to Sheila Smith because I couldn't get the H out okay. when I went to. Okay, okay. So you chose one I of went your, back well, you to chose my one original of your names. name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, so now I think, can I narrate for a second? Sure, please. So I think what I hear, I hear breathy voice breaks. I also hear, so I hear abductor voice breaks and I hear adductor. They are mm -hmm. sound specific in nature. She had a response to Botox where she got weak and breathy, mm -hmm. but because of the mixed nature, she didn't get total relief of her symptoms. Yeah. And honestly, I hear more AB ductor breaks, opening, breathy mm -hmm. breaks, than I hear of the tight breaks. And she had her vocal folds injected, mm -hmm. so maybe um, we're okay. happening on what is the primary versus the secondary. Maybe. There hasn't been enough regular injections, but that's something to right. think about. Maybe the <laughs> abductor is the primary component, and if, if you have abductor vocal fold injections, <laughs> it's only going to help a small amount. <laughs> okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is I'm probing for effort. She's describing to me quality, right? She's describing to me quality, not effort. And so what I, the first thing I think of is I want to hook, give her a hook. I want to help her feel like voice therapy is going to work, okay, or to give her some strategies. So while I'm thinking about reducing mm -hmm. effort, okay, I also want to address the fact that you feel like your voice is choppy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things that I would like to try to work on, so if your voice was breathier more consistently, if it was consistent in quality, but it was breathy, would it be acceptable to you? Well, yes, sometimes I whisper okay. because then I can get it to, you know, I have Smooth different ways of compensating. Yep. Or sometimes I talk in a high voice because sometimes that helps. helps. Okay. But when I'm really stressed. That doesn't, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. So these are all, these are, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. People with SD do talk in a high pitch or whisper as a compensation. Mm -hmm. These are totally normal responses. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to experiment with if we use a little bit more breath flow or airflow. So we have breath in our body. We have airflow coming through our vocal folds, okay? So I differentiate them because I think they come out and they manifest in different ways. I can have the best breath support in the world, but if I don't let any air out through my vocal folds, it doesn't help. Okay, so I want to see if we can experiment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this part because I wanna work on that coordination of breath and voice, okay? So I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna ask you to use your hand to feel consistent breath on your, on your hand, mm -hmm. and you're gonna do it like this. Like you're blowing out candles. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Excellent. What do you feel when you do that? Or relax. Okay, cool, great, I love that. I didn't even have to tell you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> to demonstrate this. Okay, so. <coughs> I'm getting over a cold. Okay, so now I want you to keep that smooth airflow in your hands. We're gonna do it two more times. I just want you to tune in to, you don't have to change anything, tune in to what you feel in your throat, maybe in your chest, in your abdomen, as you are exhaling that air. Oh. Okay, great. Relaxation. So I want you to try to keep the same feeling. Mm -hmm. Your throat mm -hmm. stays open. You try to keep the same amount of airflow on your hand. And if the sound is breathy, it's okay. I want you to do this. And uh, add sound with it. That's an A. And oh, an ooh. Oh, an, an ooh. ooh. Oh, this is like singing. It's like you're a go. Oh, well, scary. you don't have to. Here, let's okay. do it this way. So no, I don't want it to be scary. Try this, like a sigh of relief. It's mm -hmm. been a long day. You're like happy to sit down in your chair with a drink or whatever you <laughs> like to have at night. Um, and you're oh, air in your hand the whole time. Ooh, I have a ah, tremor. No, 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 no. Well, do you have a tremor? I think so. Okay, well, what I heard there that is not an unusual thing. The first time I taught a patient this exercise, I did. I was like, because I was nervous. <laughs> okay, so so don't let's let's ignore that. Right. Okay, and just tell me, did you feel consistent air in your hand? Yes. 
Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So let's keep that consistent airflow, and I want you to think about feeling energy in your lips when you do that. Okay. Oh. <sighs> no, that was good. Yes. So this is all an experimentation <laughs> of how you are, how you're, <laughs> what's happening with your voice. <laughs> so sometimes it's going to come out shaky. There's tug of war happening. Of your brain wants to do one thing because it's used to doing it, <laughs> and there's <are> signals <laughs> happening. I'm telling you to do another thing, and there's like a hundred people watching yes, there are. <laughs> that we're not paying attention to. Okay, let's try it again. Okay. Okay, do it again. Oh. Not bad. That was good. So now let's try now just holding it on one pitch. You can pick the pitch. I'm not gonna. Can you want me to demonstrate it? I don't care. Whatever pitch you want. This is like singing. No, okay. it's not. Um, it's like voicing. It's like making voice. Okay, let's see. Mm. Want to do okay. it together? <laughs> Good. You feel, do you feel air in your hand? Yes. Okay, so what I hear, yes, there's a little mm -hmm. bit of shakiness, mm -hmm. but there's voice in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. that was good. Try it again. <laughs> feel the air in your hand. Can you start the air first? Okay. <laughs> I'm, Go back I'm to, trying. Yeah, no, no, you're okay. doing excellent. Could I do Just something try like an E or an A? Can you rather than, well, I think I'm rather than an U? Yeah. Can you just blow on your hand again? Yes. Try a Z sound. <laughs> or a Z. <laughs> How was that? Better. How about Z? <laughs> Ooh, I liked that the best. Okay, so now try. Now, the reason I liked it is because mm -hmm. it had air mm -hmm. and there was some vibration up in here. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> yes. Try to keep the air consistent. Hold your hand a little closer. It's hard okay. to hear, feel the air on the <laughs> Good. Now, try this. Okay, so we're going to take a leap. Okay. I, if I were working mm -hmm. with you on your own, like on mm -hmm. your own when we weren't doing a demo, mm -hmm. I would practice this and I would mm -hmm. help you get more comfortable mm -hmm. with feeling consistent air, mm -hmm. feeling some buzz in the mouth, taking this sort of out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Now, try. Okay. Okay. Not bad. No. No. How was that? Fine. Yes. Let me try it again. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. I'm fine. I'm fine. Not bad. So there, even on the F, you got a little stuck, but you worked through it. Did you feel that? Okay. Try it one more time and say, I'm good. I'm good. Was that easier than the yes. previous one? Mm -hmm. So there we just played with, I could say I'm fine or I could say I'm good. I'm good for you mm -hmm. is easier because the G has voice, mm -hmm. the F mm -hmm. is just air. And that's when you get the breath in mm -hmm. you. So we start to make, in addition to this, so, so as I'm doing this, I'm listening to her voice and I'm troubleshooting. And I'm saying, okay, the ooh felt kind of eh, so mm -hmm. I could have pushed forward, mm -hmm. but I listened to her. She said, can I try a different sound? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. you can try a different sound. And so then we tried that, right? We had more success. Mm -hmm. And then we start saying different phrases. Can you keep the air into this phrase? Can you keep the energy in your mouth? It's easy to say, so we're working on technique, coordination, muscle activity, muscle interaction. But then we're also saying, fine is harder than good. I can say, I'm good. Or I can say, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Either way, right? I can choose a different word because mm -hmm. it's easier. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which is why you, you chose your, the other last uh -huh. name. Now, yeah. does this feel different when you did the and you got that sound? Did that feel different than making your regular voice? Yes, because for whatever reason, it felt more like singing. Okay. For some reason. So we can we can take that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I mean, we can take that and work mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will have people do mm -hmm. something like singing, like "How are you?" Mm -hmm. Can you try that? 
<laughs> Who cares? I'll Ignore see. the people out there. Oh, no. <laughs> you can do it lower. Okay. How are you? Okay. How are you? Try. I couldn't no, say no, before. I, I chose the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. Try, try. I am good. I am good. I am good. I'm good. How did it feel? Um, I am was fine. The good Got more difficult. Stuck. Okay. Mm -hmm. So can you see how we're navigating mm -hmm. all these things that she's feeling? And we're trying to say, how can we make it easier? Mm -hmm. These are things that we have to practice. Mm -hmm. And and while we have we have glimpses of making it easier. So sometimes I'll say, I'm great. Yes. Because that's easier. Uh -huh. I would never if someone says, How are you? It's I'm Reluctant to say I'm good because I don't know how it will come out. Will good not come out? But how I'll about say fine? I'm great. Fine. I would think good and great may be similar. Interesting. You mm -hmm. could play with it. You could. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is thank a good you. start to play with. Thank you. Thank you for putting thank you for putting yourself out there. Okay. That was nice. Thanks, Sheila. It's hard to put yourself on the spot, but you did a great job. Okay. So now I should have put this up here before because then it would kind of like lighten the mood. Um, so I want to, I just want to show you my kids because they're cute. <laughs> okay, so now let's, um, let's open the floor to questions because we have not gotten kicked off the stage yet. Yes. I really. Could you repeat a short version? Oh. So I, heard, I could hear you. you. You want me to repeat some of that? Would you like me to repeat your question? Sure. So, um, so basically what happens is when she goes out and speaks over noise, she gets very hoarse, and then she recovers very quickly. By the next morning, she's fine, but she's asking if she does any damage to her vocal folds. So the, the, the short answer is I don't know, <laughs> truthfully. The, but, but the longer sort of answer is do you, you may, um, I, would, I would imagine that it may be more muscular tension, it kind of shuts you off. Um, you get pressure in your chest. Yeah, because you're building up pressure trying to get your voice out, but your vocal folds are spasming. And so it's getting stuck sort of behind a brick wall, and the harder you push, the tighter you get. So my um, guess is that if there, it's probably mostly tension related because you recover so quickly. Um, does any, do you have a physician that ever looks at your vocal folds? Okay. So as long as there's no changes on your vocal folds that are indicators that you're hurting yourself, I would not worry about it. Just have fun, exactly. Do you have something to add to that? I would just say that if, if you have had any therapy that has taught you specific relaxation exercises, I would, do an, I would sort of do extra ones the, the morning after something like that or on the way home. Because if you are you know, working harder to get over the background noise, then you want to sort of de-escalate in a little more active way. Kind of like a little cool down. Right. But yeah. otherwise, my, my own rule of thumb is that if something bounces back pretty well by the next morning, um, you, you're not causing any permanent damage. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's OK. Here. Then we'll bring it back. So when you're in a situation where you're trying to speak in a crowded room and you're feeling that tension, what can you do to relieve that tension so that your voice comes a little easier? So the first thing that I would do is pause and take a breath. Rather than try to push through while the emergency brake is on, right, while you're hitting that wall, stop, take a breath, and try to reset or regroup. Um, I think in, in therapy, if you've, when, we, when, I, when we work with people, we work on how do you get louder and how can you do that in a way that um, results in less tension. Um, so I think there are ways that if you take the breath and kind of let, try to, try to let your voice come out in front of you, it's going to be, that might help, but that pause, sort of take the pressure off and then start again is the first thing I would start with. Um, another strategy, and this is for all kinds of voice disorders and background noise, is simply to over-articulate. Because in background noise, what people lose first is the consonants. Mm -hmm. And if they can read your lips or they're getting a little extra energy in the consonants, they, you will be understood better without having to actually push to be louder. It also puts your own frame of reference up in the front of the mouth mm -hmm. and a little bit less in the throat. So that can be a useful strategy, especially if you practice it ahead of time. 
The other thing you can try to use as a rule of thumb is to not try to be louder than everyone in the room, because most people will not be successful with that. It's trying to communicate with the person who's in front of you. Right. So Get you're up close. looking at them, you're getting closer, you're trying to be in the noise rather than over the noise. We have time for one more. Can we, Joanna, can we go back here? She was oh, yes. asking. I've had a couple observations, and one is that if I raise my pitch um, and talk in a sing-songy voice, I can do pretty well. Yes. But, so if I talk really soft and do this, I can actually sound pretty good. But the problem is, is my brain does not want to do that, and I can't sustain it. But if I talk in a, like a southern accent or an English accent, mm -hmm. suddenly it's like, you know, well, y'all, what y'all doing? I can sound pretty darn good. So, so I don't get it. <laughs> so all of these things, so the theory that we sort of function on is that all of these patterns are non-habitual voice patterns where you are potentially, and maybe John can jump in, you're potentially accessing some other neural pathway that is not related to your habit of voice production, and so it makes it easier for a short time. This, I have to tell you, when we're working on differential diagnosis, is a hallmark of SD. And it's something that people whispering, singing, or going into a, an, a, some sort of non-habitual voice pattern, it, it, tell, it confirms that to, it's SD, I think, in, in our minds a lot of times. Um, but that doesn't make it easier. It sort of makes you feel like you have to flip in and out. So part of it, it I think, is, is practicing those voices. And we were talking about pra frequency of practice earlier. Practicing it short times throughout the day so you keep accessing it to see if you can fall into that easy voice when you need to more, e more, more quickly. Did that just make sense? All right. Okay. Thank you all. Wonderful job for Sarah.